Yes, well, welcome you all. Uh, this is Ahmed Faruk Aysan. Uh, I guess uh, that's coming up. Uh, slides also. Uh, this is Ahmed Faruk Aysan uh, from the Ahmad bin Halife University from College of Islamic Studies. I will be moderating this session on fintech, necessary or luxury. Uh, it is jointly organized. I mean, we, we would like to thank Beitul Meshura for organizing this event and uh, we would like to contribute this event through uh, being a moderator uh, from uh, the HPQU side. And we are very much delighted to have our speaker, uh, Professor Hussein Abdu, today with us. We are very delighted to have him here, uh, to, not with us, uh, but uh, from UK. Uh, we are all joining the event from different parts of the world. Uh, but, but I was wondering about this presentation for a couple of weeks now, and I'm really eager to listen to Professor Hussein, so I will not uh, get into too much into detail, but let me, before that, let me give some information about the importance of the event. Uh, the banking is changing in the last uh, 20 years, especially through digitalization. Probably it is the most affected sectors. I'm sure you have attended some events and they show that the banking is the most affected sectors through uh, from digitalization and that's why we have fintech and that's why in last uh, years especially uh, people are investing more in on fintech the banks are investing regulators are investing the countries are having uh, some uh, uh, strategies nationwide strategies uh, goals for fintech uh, and uh, Professor Hussein Abdu has joined some events in Qatar last year uh, and in the previous year, so he is very familiar. And he is a very distinguished fellow in FinTech. This is a newly developing field, and as you can see, uh, the new generation of academics like uh, Professor Hussein are coming like a star in the market uh, and uh, contributing in FinTech. Uh, we at uh, College of Islamic Studies, uh, we have Islamic Economics uh, uh, program, Islamic Finance and Economy program, and we also appreciate the importance of uh, fintech developments, and that's why uh, in the last three, four years, we start incorporating fintech issues, uh, problems, uh, challenges into our uh, curriculum. And also next year, uh, we will even offer a separate course on fintech, separately just on fintech. And we have a working group, uh, mostly composed of PhD students and uh, graduate students from HPQU. We have some faculty staff uh, from various parts of the world and mostly from HPQU. And we try to listen and learn from others, especially in fintech, this is important because this is not a very established field. It is not like banking. I mean, it has been around for many centuries or even before. Uh, it is a new topic, so we have a lot to learn from practice and uh, we have to listen to others. And you know, in fintech, there are many different issues, so it is good to listen to others, academics, practitioners, and there are very good ideas coming out from practitioners, especially uh, uh, because it, it, it is still a growing field, so it is good to learn from each other. So I also would like to invite you to our uh, uh, working group seminars, uh, which are generally taking place on Wednesdays at around this time, around the six. So you are more than welcome uh, for the seminars as well. Without further ado, I don't want to be acting like a, a, a seminar presenter. Uh, we have a very distinguished uh, professor uh, here with us today, so I wouldn't want to uh, take too much of his time. So let me just briefly talk about uh, Professor Hussein Abdu. He is right now uh, the faculty uh, director, deputy dean for research and innovation at the Faculty of Business and Justice, the University of Central Lanchester, Lanchester, yeah, UK with demonstrated history of working in higher education industry. He is a highly skilled researcher who freshly applies artificial intelligence modeling techniques, methodologies into banking, finance, accounting research. Professor Abdu is qualified in analytical skills, leadership, lecturing, risk management, and so on. He is well knowledgeable professional with robust background in inter alia building scoring models in developing countries, fintech applications, and it is disruption to the financial industry. He is also a professional trainer in big data analytics, 
fintech applications, risk management, scoring modeling techniques, and Islamic finance and economics. Professor Abdu developed a notable strong research profile resulting from more than 45 international peer reviewed journal articles during the past eight years. He is the member of a number of professional bodies across the universe, including RIMA, IFAP's very distinguished associations uh, in Europe and UK and US. Professor Abdi is a keynote speaker in a number of international events, conferences, including uh, very distinguished ones like FinTech North, FinTech Fundamentals, uh, panel discussions, I, uh, ICI 2015, FMA 2018. So, uh, mashallah, he has a very rich uh, and very good articles. Again, I mean, uh, these are the new stars of the academia also because of the changing field. So I am very delighted to uh, be moderating this session. And without further ado, actually, just as a warm up uh, question, Professor Hussein Abdu, actually, you know Qatar, you know Beitul Mashura. Uh, could you give us some information about your experience, especially with regard to the Beitul Meshura, how do you get to know and uh, how was your experience and how do you approach it? Thank you very much again, uh, definitely for being with us today and kindly accepting the invitation. It's a great pleasure. Please. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Um, actually, um, I was invited uh, by Beitul Meshura last February um, to participate in their International Six Conference. And um, I was truly impressed by the way they organized the whole event. Um, their infrastructure, the reach and networking, professional staff, um, all in all was really good experience. Um, Baitan Mashura is a specialist center for consultation related to different areas, such as finance, investment management, Sharia audit, and professional training. Um, it was established back in 2017 and obtained um, the license from um, the Qatari Central Bank for offering financial and investment consultation. Um, thereby, it has become the first Qatari firm to obtain such a license from um, the state of Qatar. It is the first institution in the state of Qatar offering these kind of um, services, such as Sharia and financial advisory, supervision, external and internal audit, as well as management consultancy. In my view, they have a successful track record of leading and providing highest standard of quality and excellence through modern scientific methods and qualified individuals, which embedded in their values, actually. But a key highlight for me here is that Baitul Mashura gives to spreading and developing of fintech industry in Qatar and within the region as well, for both banks and firms alike. And uh, that Bait and Mashura has always played a key role in my point of view in the development of the financial sector and contributing to the development, the reshaping of the future of the financial service industry, thus aiding to growth of the fa global financial market and has been one of the most successful at for, um, fostering the financial um, industry. Um, I would keep it short, but it's my pleasure to join you guys today, and um, hopefully uh, we will all benefit from such a presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hussain. So let me start with the title of the presentation, uh, your talk, uh, Is Fintech Necessary or Luxury, from your perspective? Um, thanks once again, Amit. Um, before we start, I would like um, to ask the audience, our audience, a very simple question, actually. Is fintech necessary or luxury? Um, I would give you guys 30 seconds. Um, our colleagues from um, IT department will um, just ask the question. It will pop up on the screen right now. Um, if I can have your feedback around whether you think that fintech is necessary or luxury. So we will have 30 seconds and afterwards uh, there will be an answer. So throughout the uh, talk, we will have this sort of questions such that you, we also want to get your opinions. Okay, the results are out, by the way. So okay. <laughs> necessary. 
Thanks very much, guys. 94% of our audience today believe it is unnecessary, and only 9% um, thinks that it's a luxury. Okay, let's um, talk about this in more details. Can, can I take the results off now? Thank you very much. So, I think when the poll question came, it just, um, let me try to reshare my screen again. When the poll question come on the screen, it doesn't stop me from controlling my screen at the end. Okay. So, uh, one major question for me here, guys, as I said, whether it's a necessary or luxury, or it's a necessary luxury. How will, it, how will it impact individuals and businesses? That's a very key question for me. So let me start with um, an institutional level. I'm sure most of you will be familiar with um, the top picture. Um, it's for Ramon Martin Chavez, the ex deputy chief financial officer of Goldman Sachs, who explained back in 2017 that the company's US cash equity trading division used to employ over 600 human traders back in 2000. By the time of his talk, that number is down to just two human traders with the rest of the jobs being taken over by automated training platform that are managed by around 200 computer engineers. That's smashing, isn't it? 600 down to only two and the rest is computer machines. This shows that the future of artificial intelligence impl implemented by FinTech promises a new era of disruption and productivity, where human originality is enhanced by speed and precision. Another example, the lower picture, Richard Lum, the ex chief executive at Accenture Financial Service Operating Group, stated that in one of his talks recently, Demand for fintech by banks is growing because of regulatory and capital pressures, competition from large technology players like Google, Amazon, and financial, Tencent in China, and the abundance of new security threats. He also believes that the rise of new technologies, frontiers such as cryptocurrencies and cybersecurity, among others, are just a beginning to open up and expects black blockchain technology to have the greatest overall impact on the financial service sector. Let me give you some examples around how big ticks, I'm not talking about fintechs, big ticks, massive giant players in the market, moved from disruption to maturity. A very famous example, Ant Financial, the giant Chinese company. Back in 2004, Alibay launched both online and mobile payment platform. In 2008, Alibay adopted by 150 million users with transaction volumes around 100 million US dollar. In 10 years time only, by 2018, Ant's money market fund, known as Yao Pao, become world's largest money market fund with 168 billion US dollar. In 2019, all of China's mutual funds managers are on the Ant Marketplace, Ant Fortune platform that reaches 180 million users worldwide. See the reach. They are not like financial institutions who work on a national level, on a continental level, on a local city level, much wider reach. Another example is Amazon. We all know Amazon. 2007, Amazon Bay launched. 2016, Amazon Bay reached 33 million customers in 170 countries. Can you imagine this? That's double of transaction volume compared to 2015. In 2017, Amazon lending facilities, 3 billion US dollars in loans to 20,000 plus small medium businesses in US, Japan, and UK only. In 2020, big move, smashing. There is a talk with Goldman Sachs to offer small businesses loans and BBVA piloting to make sales on the platform as well. Can you imagine these moves, guys? It's, it's quite interesting. Um, other examples due to time constraints, I'm not going to talk about it now, but Tencent, um, Apple, Google are very famous um, examples. Before I move to the individual levels, which is really interesting, can I have the second pool question? 
And this would be around which of the following fintech products or services do you use? And I would invite our audience as well to answer this question. Again, can I remind you, you have 30 seconds to choose the best, with the best of your knowledge, which of these um, products or services do you use the most? Thank you. Digital sure. payments come on top. 40, sorry, 80% of our audience believe that digital payments, I can't blame you, definitely. Um, followed by, is it 12%? Um, remittances, followed by blockchain and other crowdfunding. 12% is remittances, yes. Interesting. Right, so talking about individual levels now, FinTech, how this um, stepped into our everyday life, everything we do actually. I would like you to imagine with me 20 years ago, would you be able to pay bills? For example, your rent, your mortgage, electricity, phone or services such as insurance, online shopping, food and others, that easy that we do nowadays? I would say simply thanks for FinTech. You can send money to a friend via PayPal or even deposit a check by snapping a photo of it with your smartphone. You can also take a taxi ride without handing the driver either cash or your credit card. Over the past decade, these transactions have become so intertwined into the fabric of day-to-day -day existence that they no longer seem revolutionary. If you look to which areas will affect our day-to-day -day activities, enable individuals to access and manage their finances. FinTech technologies and the large number of payments apps that are available have completely changed how user managers and access their finances. Mobile apps, I'll give you examples. Apple Bay, uh, PayPal apps, Venmo, Google, even Facebook messengers and others have overtaken how users approach the management of their finances. In the past, back and system of banks used FinTech to support their operation. Am I right? The back offices used FinTech to develop such a technology which is not available for others. Recently, the choice that individual and business users have when it comes to, for example, trading, investing, borrowing, getting an insurance policy has entirely changed by the new technology, isn't it? An innovation introduced by FinTechs. Nowadays, it is possible for users to manage their funds, trade, banking, and even pay for food deliveries via their smartphone. We all do this at one click. When you move to more professional stuff like um, personal finance apps and budgeting apps, using complicated Excel sheets to track and manage your expenses is no longer necessary in my point of view. Fintech has led to the development of several financial services apps allowing consumers to easily and efficiently keep track of their expenses, income, and other finance needs, even investments in one single place. Budgeting apps, I'll give you an example like Intu, I-N-T-U, help users do everything in one place and using a single device. Crowdfunding platforms and mobile payments, this is the top as per our audience. Fintech crowdfunding platforms such as Kickstarter, InKind, Patreon, and GoFundMe are just examples of how new innovations are changing the way people and businesses source funds. Going to a bank to get a loan like we used to do several times ago is no longer necessary, which was the only option until a few years ago. Am I right? We all went to a bank asking for loans if we needed it, but it's not necessary anymore. Crowdfund platforms allow users to send, receive, or even bitch for money from others. The rise on this kind of activities and the number of crowdfund platforms over the years only goes to show the growing popularity 
and convenience this niche offer. Every one of us, with no exception, use their smartphone to make at least one payment by now. Am I right? It is convenient, quick, and easy, according to a Statista data study. The mobile payment niche itself was set to cross one trillion US dollars in 2019 only. We are not talking about millions and billions anymore, trillions of dollars industry. And new innovation that allow for simple scan and pay features, allow users to simply make a payment for any service without the need to manually feed in any details. And finally, not to take that much from your time, the rise of blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Emerging technologies such as these are allowing users to capitalize what fintech can do for them in more ways than one. Cryptocurrency exchange like Gemini, BitZ, Riot BTC and Coinbase and others help users to buy and sell cryptocurrencies like Litecoins and Bitcoins. New era of currencies. In addition to this blockchain innovation via services like BlockVerify, for example, have helped reduce fraud and protect the transactions of customers. While these new technologies are still developing and the market is still not completely aware or confident about them, it is easy to see how they have already started impacting FinTech as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much. Back to you, Ahmed. May, may I ask uh, the relevant question, actually? You talk about the disruptions happening in the market, but you talk about it more from the consumer's perspective. And definitely those changes are happening and happening very fast. What do you think after COVID-19, uh, will uh, is it going to accelerate the process? What are the challenges? Uh, what are the opportunities? And also it will be great if you can talk about the implications for the banks. I'm sure we have bankers among us and uh, uh, they are consumers on the one side of the uh, FinTech products, but at the same time, they're also uh, competing and probably observing this fintech developments. So it will be great uh, to, to tell us about uh, your expectations about the COVID-19 and especially the challenges for the bankers. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, actually, you touch in the next two questions, actually, um, which is the growth and how fintech industry will disrupt um, the sector and the effect of COVID-19. Um, can I ask for um, the next poll question, please? Um, do you think fintech disrupt the sector? Thanks very much. So the results are- Well, I was expecting more even, but anyway, 72% um, of our audience believe it does and only 33 um, believe it doesn't. Right, so let me just comment on this. Moving forward, I'm not sure why every time when the screen, when you have these poll questions, my screen, I lose control from my end. Yeah, that's it, here we go. Right, I think it is quite obvious now, guys, that fintechs have moved from disruption to maturity. That's clear. But a key question for me here before we comment on this, how much is the fintech industry worth? How much is the fintech industry growing and who are the main users? Let me just give you some ideas about how big and how much um, the industry worth. The global financial sector is expected to worth 26.5 trillion US dollars by 2020 within a year, with a compound annual growth rate of 6%. Fintech market shares across 48 fintech unicorns is worth over 187 billion US dollars as of the first half of 2019. Fintech reaches 55.3 billion US dollars in, in, in investments in 2019. And by the way, 
China contributed a total of 25.5 billion US dollars, of which more than half is from Ant Financial, the Alibaba Group, the big, big tick in China, the big giant um, in, um, in China. And um, this still us lead, uh, a nice story about how big is industry, but would be nice to see from our audience as well, how big is fintech industry worldwide? Do you think it's in millions, billions, trillions? Can I have that following poll question, please? Thank you. We are talking about fintech industry worldwide, not in a particular continent, in a particular country, or a particular segment or sector like Islamic uh, fintech or other fintechs, worldwide, all in all. I think it's pretty much obvious, isn't it? Clearly, trillions, absolutely. More than 50% of our audience believe that that's the truth. That's, that's pretty much obvious. Thank you. Thank you. I need just to click again on my screen. Yep. Right, let me just change this quickly. So, if I take you forward um, through um, another... Um, piece of information around how much is fintech industry growing. Can you believe that fintech has a compound annual growth rate of 25 to 30% in the forecast period 2019-2025? And e-commerce is one of the biggest growth drivers in fintech with compound annual growth rates of 10 to 12%. Blockchain again plays an important role and RegTech regulatory technology these are the fastest growing segments of the fintech industry. Looking to that figure on the screen, top US fintech startup segments, you can tell that the top three are payments and settlements, capital markets, data analytics. You can also tell that the number of fintech startups by regions, um, just below 5,800 in Americas just above 3,500 in Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and just below 2,800 in Asia Pacific. Also transaction values for digital payments and personal finance are in trillions of dollars. That shows how big massive is the industry, isn't it? FinTech may disrupt 4.7 trillion US dollars of global financial service revenue. Massive, huge movements. Three out of four people worldwide have used FinTech services. But who do you think are the users of FinTech? And this will lead to um, the next poll question, if you don't mind. Who do you think are the main users? Millennials, I generation, other generation? I think it's pretty much obvious question as well, isn't it? <laughs> However, I have to remind you there is no general rule of thumbs when it comes to um, fintech industry. Um, actually, yeah, interesting. I will clarify this. 64% millennials, 49% Z generation or I generation and older generation 8%. Interesting, interesting, thank you. Um, I would agree with you guys. Main users are either millennials or I generations. Millennials are a bit older, as you know, and G, G generations or I generations are a bit younger. Um, however, my own view when it comes to um, fintechs, there is no rules of thumbs here. Um, a study investigates the role of technology in mortgage lending by Suez National Bank and Federal Reserve Bank of New York. What they have done, they conducted a cross-sectional pattern in who borrowers from fintech lenders. 
they found that fintech borrowers is higher among more educated population, which we all expect, but surprisingly among older borrowers. Presumably because older borrowers are familiar with the process of obtaining a mortgage and thus more willing to borrow online. So let me clarify something here. When it comes to fintech, more developed nations you may find a completely different scenario and elder people might be willing to use technology. In less developed or developing countries, the rule of millennials and I generation and much more. I'm sure you're aware of those statistics as well. There are 300 million individuals in Middle East only under the age of 24. That's a great opportunity, isn't it? That, that means that FinTech industry can tackle and attract a lot of attention in Middle East. 1.7 billion individuals worldwide are unbanked. Large proportion of those unbanked individuals, which may be older or young people, no one knows, but the vast majority will be older, are, world, world, are worldwide available for FinTech industry. Huge investments is expected, isn't it? I'll keep it that short and back to you, Amit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, would you like to add something on the effects of COVID-19? Of course, uh, of course, of course, absolutely. But before we move towards this, um, I would like to ask our audience one more question again. Do you guys think that FinTech would provide more challenges or opportunities? That's a challenging one, isn't it? Everyone can view this question from a different point of view. And um, I would be um, willing to see how our audience will react to such um, a question. Wow. Interesting, 24% um, thinks there are challenges and 84% thinks there are opportunities. Interesting. <laughs> Let me just move again, that's absolutely fine. So, of course, COVID-19 does provide new challenges. And I would 100% agree with our um, audience. Regardless of all the challenges that currently exist due to COVID-19, all um, the virtual world we live in, like the event today, for example, I still believe there are much more opportunities. But let me clarify to you what are the current challenges, because we need to be aware of them. According to CB Insights, COVID-19 raised uncertainty on the future of fintech industry. That's a fact. No one can deny it. As the appetite of fintech by investors in some continents, such as Asia, has been the lowest earlier in 2020 for the first time, by the way, since 2016. And numerous players will be forced to shut down due to the lack of capital mainly, and consequently number of FinTech startups may decrease. They may decrease, they don't have to, but they have an advantage definitely. There is also a notable decline in the income across different types of businesses and individuals, which may increase default. In fact, the statistics show is that 54% of borrowers will loan only after the lockdown restrictions are relaxed. In Europe alone, during March and April 2020, B2B lending dropped to one third of the cumulative volume of previous months and forced similar platforms to collapse. This is clear that there is a decline in financial industry performance due to COVID-19. According to Bloomberg, the average cost to income ratio at the top European banks amounted at 67% in 2019, the highest rate ever since 20, uh, 2008. Return on equity fell to the lowest level ever in three years at minus 8.7%. Guys, those, those consequences are severe, are huge, and have really high impact on the industry from a business perspective. As consequences of COVID-19, limited access to funds, low incomes, workforce reductions, and job losses, financial uncertainty, and decrease the number and size of bank deposits, and purpose loans. In, in Europe, purpose loans are really famous. 
loans such as mortgage loans, such as car loans, home improvement, holiday loans, and others. For example, it has been predicted that the decline in revenues of European and American banks in 2020 would amount to 8.5%, while profit would be 30% lower than predicted in 2019. So banks would need to change their operating model and digital transformation strategy, isn't it? By providing smaller loans and access customers less formally, these rigid restrictions need to be eased a little bit. By the acquiring fintech firms or working together as similar to fintech firms. Let me give you some examples about the big move in the market now. Financial supermarket Go Beer has recently acquired Aja Credit. Vodacom and Safaricom, the largest Kenyan firms, have completed the takeover of MBISA, the Africa's largest platform from Vodafone UK. In addition, there are also some discussions about Metro Bank, potential acquisition of Freight Sitter, one of the largest B2B lending platforms in the UK, and the well known Western Union potential acquisition of MoneyGram. If I move forward to the next slide, and I need to control it over my computer here. Thank you. This study here is a global fintech regulatory rapid assessment study by Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance, the CCAF, shows a number of challenges. I would focus up on the three only. Challenges to perform core function, visiting sites, for example, um, while working remotely. That's really challenging. And that's why it came in the top 49%. Coordination with other agencies domestically, access to accurate and or timely data for regulation purposes, and amongst other things as well. But when I talk about opportunities, I'm not going to make this as a poll question, but I would like to ask you guys, do you have any cash in your wallet right now? If the answer is no, there is something going on. If the answer is yes, there is another something going on. Have you ever bought something using your mobile phone? How many times have you visited your bank in the last six months? How many times have you made online purchases in the last six months? Let me tell you something. If your answer to the first question is no, second one is yes, and the answer for the third and fourth is zero or one, this means that a huge movements around you, even without realizing that these moves in, are in place. So when we talk about opportunities, a lot of opportunities in my point of view, and that's why I would 100% agree with our audience uh, views on the poll question. Clearly, worldwide, COVID-19 caused a big change in how individuals are running their businesses and how they are living their daily life. Fintech industry is massive, huge, big industry, allows users to be able to facilitate their payments, manage their accounts and funds via their smartphones or any other portable device, by the way, without need to face-to-face -face interactions like all days. But let me assume with you now that COVID-19 had hit the world 20 years ago, early 20s, 20, 20, um, 2001, 2002. Would it have been this easy to manage personal finances from home with current restriction taking place. All these restrictions, all these um, lockdowns, would it be that easy to manage your finances, to live in that world? I would leave the answer to you. Our experience with our carrying, spending, saving, transferring, investing, and borrowing money were completely different compared to what's going on today. Those who are benefiting from digital world are likely to continue using it post COVID-19. Would you agree with me? If you are using currently um, this kind of technology, you would continue to use it. As a good example, cashless payments. Going cashless, that's a strategy, that's a trend now. United Kingdom, for example, Germany, Ireland, Poland, Sweden, Norway, even in Middle East, Egypt, and other countries have raised limits on their size of contactless payments, and in some cases it has been doubled. COVID-19 may also create new opportunities for some fintechs. For example, as social distancing has taken hold worldwide, there has been tremendous growth in the use of digital financial services and e-commerce. 
according to the new global fintech regulatory rapid assessment study conducted by the CCAF at the Judge Business School and the Worldwide in Cambridge School. The study demonstrates that COVID-19 has moved fintech up the regulatory agenda with financial regulators responding with both sector-wide and fintech-specific measures to harness opportunity and mitigate risks. This gives you an idea that there is an opportunity here by regulatory bodies worldwide to pay much more attention to fintech industry. Fintech can also expand their partnership strategy by looking at opportunities with other fintechs and big techs, and even non-financial service firms. And finally, support digital banking by increasing industry security. Can you imagine, guys, number of cyber attacks between February and April 2020 alone? These two months alone skipped a surprising 238%. Wow, that's that's unbelievable. Growth of digital payments and growing and going cashless, as per the World Health Organization advice. In fact, it is expected that 45% of individuals have changed the way they bank during the crisis in the US. And there has been 20% increase in digital engagement in Europe. Let me move to the next slide. Surprising. Regardless of all the pandemic hits, 2020 funding hits new records despite the pandemic. If you look to the upper line, which is number of deals, third largest in history. If you look to the lower figure, lower part of the figure, $130 billion in investments during the pandemic. So as much as the pandemic provides some challenges, some threats, I believe it does provide much more opportunity. Back to you, Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hussein. It is great that you are following the market. You are not just writing papers, academic papers, but uh, especially in fintech, I believe we very much learn from practice and we implement it. So my next question will be related with, it, with this, actually. Uh, apparently, you are following the market as well. What are your expectations about the fintech top trends in 2020, 2021? Uh, where are we headed? Thank you very much, Ahmed. Um, that's a very good question indeed. And that will lead to the next um, question. Do you guys think our audience, the artificial intelligence and machine learning will boost automation in the financial sector? I think it's another pretty much clear question for our millennials and I generation attending today. Thanks very much. <laughs> Not surprising at all. Uh, pretty much uh, obvious, 100%. Um, I'm not sure why uh, our percentage are not cumulative. Our audience, I guess, say yes and no at the same time. That's why you might have. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's interesting answer. But to comment on this, I would move to um, the next bit of my presentation today, which is talking about top trends. And when it comes to top trends, um, I would um, like to simply share with you some views here, guys. If we look to, sorry, I, I need to adjust my screen. Every time you show your um, book questions, my screen goes blank. Right, thank you. Um, I would discuss with you today, um, Cape Gemini, large um, um, institution, offered as part of their financial services analysis report, a number of top trends for banking, payments, wealth management, and capital markets. And if I have to speak about each one of these, I will spend the whole day speaking about it. But I will try to summarize um, from my point of view, what are the main issues here? In my views, these trends are centralized around three main areas. Artificial intelligence solutions, deep customer insights, and data-driven compliance. In addition, of course, to the well-known booming trend now, which is open banking noise and open X with application programming interface, um, ABI. We'll talk about it in more details um, in the rest of uh, the time of our presentation. 
clearly traditional players within the banking industry are struggling to be relevant in terms of the products they offer. Future ready technology that most of fintech um, institutions are using nowadays and meeting their customers' expectations. These are the most important issues for me here. Future ready technology and meeting your customers' expectations. Competition from big techs such as Ant Financial, Amazon, Apple, Google, adding complexity and pushing banks to move beyond traditional products and services to their customer needs. Um, I believe similarly payments are in no difference to the other financial services. It is revolving nowadays into an open ecosystem, a future state of um, the industry, so-called open X. As for the growth of uh, wealth management in terms of trends, for growth management, the disruption is twofold in my point of view, digital transformation and customer experiences. With millennials, as our audience expected, demanding new technologies, hyper-personalization, new expression, and a sustainable investing with deep customer insights. To be able to analyze customer sentiments, by the way, to deliver hyper-personalization services, they would need to invest in both artificial intelligence and machine learning to improve their customer advisors' relationships. With cyber attacks, Look at that figure, 238% within two months in 2020. In place, with the negative consequence of the digital transformation, various regulatory bodies are pushing towards the use of data-driven compliance policies. And of course, capital markets are in no difference as well, and are taking similar direction towards data-driven compliance and intelligent solution. Before I move to talk about much more trends, not a specific to banking or payments or wealth management or even capital markets. These are more general trends booming in the market now. Can I ask our audience the next poll question? Which of the following payments apps do you use the most? You've got Apple Pay, PayPal, Google Pay, Zilli, Venmo, Cash App, Facebook Messengers, or others. The market is full of new apps, payments apps now. I don't think we can predict which one is, <laughs> okay. Vast majority of our audience use PayPal. I can't blame you. Apple Bay, Google Bay come second, and Apple Bay come third. Cash App, and a lot of people mentioned others. Forty-two percent. Absolutely, the market is full of um, new apps nowadays. Right. Let me touch with you guys here a little bit about the new trends like robotic process automation (RPA). It's a technology where human repeatable tasks will be handled by robots. I'm sure with the help of artificial intelligence algorithms, a lot of tasks such as customer requests, completing forms, entering data, or even analyzing these data, producing reports, sending invoices, security checks, onboarding, even risk management, management and others. This could be extended, by the way, to include compliance process and fraud in the near future. All will be handled by robots. In my view, what is innovative here is human errors are eliminated. But at the same time, this is scary because this would imply a huge reduction on workforce. Look at what Ramon Chavez has said, 600 down to two only humans. But I don't think we need to think here like, it's a replacement process. I believe we need to think like it's a human and machine um, process, because I don't think it's a replacement. I, I think we need to think how intelligent is um, automation. We need to think that it's a collaborative work between humans and the machines, but this means competition will be much higher. Decentralized finance, DeFi. I was personally, I was not aware of this expression before actually. 
Um, it's a new expression. Zach Prince, the BlockFi chief executive, explained uh, that DeFi is an idea where finance would be as open as internet. Can you imagine this? It doesn't matter where are you from or how much money you have, you should be able to access the same product that someone who is in different place with a lot more money is also accessing. Unbelievable. Andreas Steiner, he's an information security expert at smart arbitrage system firm called RB Smarter, said that DeFi platforms would primarily be used by clients who wish to take loans easily and instantly without the more formal credit check that has been in place for decades by more conventional traditional banks. No checks are needed. As this means they are secured loans? I can say yes, they are unsecured loans. He also added that DeFi will help people who hold the crypto earn interest on their holdings by depositing it into the DeFi platforms. Kind of investment. Let me give you an example. New York-based trading firm, Genesis. Genesis is a large trading firm in the US market, which lend both cash and the cryptos. Reported that loans increased by 21% during the fourth quarter in 2019 to reach 545 million US dollar. That's more than 10 times the amount of gross in loans by J.B. Morgan, the United States largest, where loans balances increased by just 2%. Can you imagine this? Moving to the last one due to time constraints, I'm not going to talk about them all definitely, but last one, data-based hyper-personalization. It is a technology where AI and real-time customers' data are used to deliver more relevant product and services to each users. Using your client's data is a key issue for the future. Controlling, analyzing, visualizing these data is really important. Fintech platforms and financial institutions are increasingly using customers' browsing data and pushing patterns to customize the products and services they offer them. It provides a personalized one-to-one -one marketing experience for their customers. This will allow them definitely to provide products and services at times when they are the most relevant and useful. Other trends you can think about, but it's much easier to think about it now. Easy and faster alternative loan options, increased use of fintech by banks, blockchain, and more. Thanks very much. Back to you, Amit. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Singh. Uh, as, I mean, it is quite challenging, actually, to observe all these challenge, challenges for the bankers, for the consumers, as you rightly mentioned, the employees. Uh, so what should be our strategies uh, for the banks uh, for to adopt this uh, fintech technologies because we are uh, it is still in transition we are all learning and uh, things are not like mature it's still in transition and it's quite difficult to do uh, strategies under the circumstances but it will be great yeah. actually if we can touch upon uh, the possible absolutely strategies. absolutely in, in fact, um, Amit, uh, that's a very challenging, hard question to answer because there is no one single strategy would fit for all purposes. But I would like to ask our audience and uh, test their um, knowledge, which they have proved successful for all the poll questions. But I think this next question will be a bit challenging for them. Which of the following payments technologies would you use? Biometric cards, fingerprints, and or facial recognition, or iBay? I'm not sure if you heard about eBay or not, but let's see. Interesting. Some of our audience um, have heard about um, eBay, regardless of the very short um, time they have developed it in one of the European countries. But most of them are using fingerprints and facial recognition. I think due to Apple, thanks for Apple iPhones, who in, in, implemented this back in 2014, if you remember, followed by biometric cards. Um, that's coming in the new year, maybe in two years, and iPay. Thank you. Um, I would say here that this figure on the screen shows six different strategies 
developed by International Data Cooperation, IDC. Um, they define digital transformation as the disruptive changes that organizations such as banks experience when they employ new sources of digital innovation and creativity to fundamentally improve the businesses. In my views, if I have to go through each one of these as well, I will take the whole day, but I will try to summarize it for you. In my view, successful digital transformation strategy requires IT to be delivered in a fast, connected, agile, and simplified way across financial institutions. In order to work better, fast, and more efficiently, three key elements for me here, customers, technology, and processes. An effective customer strategy wouldn't be successful without these three elements. Your customers, your on-time daily technology, and your processes. Customers always find innovative ways to use technology. Am I right? We all do this. And by meeting their expectation would mean more sustainable strategy for the future. And institutions should react to meet that demand. Otherwise, they can lose their clients in the future, in the near future. They should also transform to adopt capabilities that new technologies continue to bring. Based on recent research, 31% of activities related to evaluating information are accomplished by digital workers. And this expected to increase by over 56% in only two years. Risky. According to Zitro, this is a nonprofit organization um, dedicated to the development of um, softwares and serve uh, for researchers and cultural heritage institutions. The way that people interact with um, new technologies has changed. That's their views. And I would agree with them, definitely, as a consequence. So their expectation, both in terms of performance, particularly speed, and ease of interaction is really important. For more agile businesses, digital transformation can help create new revenues, teams, and provide additional opportunities like we discussed uh, to COVID-19 to increase value to customers. However, they discussed uh, more than 12 elements. I would focus up on four only here. For successful strategy, financial institutions would need, among other things, to do the following. Unify infrastructure, which is really important issue. Consolidate physical sites, merge disparate hardware and centralize remote processes and so on and so on. Enable agility, exploit new technologies, adopt to um, changing customers' behaviors, really important as well. And they need to foster innovation, definitely. Leverage the best software solutions to empower the workforce and demonstrate the value of digital transformation. And believe it or not, you don't have to go for public cloud only. You need to invest in multi-clouds. So step to the cloud is another issue. Test and migrate, migrate workloads bi-directionally between 350 plus Zertu cloud service providers and to public clouds such as Microsoft Azure, Amazon Web Services, and IBM clouds. So that would form the next bit of our question here, which is which areas of infrastructure that they need to focus upon? Which areas of investments, indeed? Artificial intelligence and machine learning, definitely. Multi-clouds, big data analytics is a booming issue. The problem with big data is most of people now, most of millennials, whether you're old or young, it doesn't matter. They use social networks. They use social platforms, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, whether it's um, a Snapchat, whatever is the platform. And these platforms provide a very rich source of data. But the problem with it, in my point of view, that most of these data are flying data. Data which appear only once a lifetime. If you catch it, you catch it. If not, gone. And this will require high intelligence, big data analytic techniques, and technology to catch these data, hold in it, and invest. Blockchain, cybersecurity, continuity data predictions, all this stuff are really important. Let me tell you one more thing as well. Fingerprints and eye scan technology. Let me clarify this to you guys. Back in 2014, Apple introduced Apple Bay. We all know this. 
that enable its smartphone users to make payments simply by using fingerprints. And later on, two years ago, uh, by facial recognition, recognizing your face features on their smartphones. This technology is now widely accepted by most businesses and developed economies. 43%, that's 383 million out of 900 million of iPhone users worldwide using Apple Pay. So that's, that comes the first, that comes first before PayPal in my point of view. Biometric payment cards can offer another alternative to more traditional chip and pay and pin cards. People are struggling um, to remember their pin cards, if, particularly in Europe, the, the, the most um, uh, famous style is to have more than one card, more than one credit card. And to remember all your pin cards, that's a nightmare in some time. So biometric payment cards would provide an alternative that would suit more the more tech savvy customers. In my views, this could be seen, and I would agree with a lot of other people on this, as a step uh, backward. People are moving forward, not backward. The industry appears to have been moved away from payment cards to mobile. So why we go back to cards? The question would be to our audience, to all people around the world, would you be, or how likely are consumers, are you to adopt these technologies if they were available? Surprisingly, it is predicted that five, 179 million biometric cards will be in use by 2023, in two years' times. On top of this, it is predicted that 54% of the UK customers would be open to using biometric cards if they were available from their banks. On the other hand, by contrast, some financial institutions and technology companies, big ticks, are going one step further with trials well underway in the era of device-less biometric payments. No devices are needed, enabling customers to pay by who they are, authenticating the transactions through fingerprints, iris, or face recognition. As these types of payments require um, specific, um, specifically designed uh, biometric BOS systems, their potential lies in specific uh, markets and use cases. Going to the most interesting bit, in my point of view, Ruxwaf is a Polish company who invested in technology, scans your eyes to make contactless payments. I'm sure when, you, when our audience choose um, iBay, they think it's, um, it's a science fiction, but it is truth. Um, Ruxwaf company in Poland has come with a revolutionary uh, technology from uh, form the payments, the future payments scanning human eyes. The first company in world, to the best of my knowledge, to launch iris payment on the commercial market. They call it Bay Eye. Scientists and IT specialists developed the biometric technology and the micro banking systems that operates the Bay Eye technology. The technology takes a digital scanned image of the iris, which is then converted into a special code to authorize the payment. According to the co, um, their co-founder, Christian Kolchiski, the system is quicker than contactless payments with a card, phone, or smartphone. And he's funny enough said, you don't have to worry about um, leaving your eyes at home. <laughs> that's, that's quite funny. Um, all these technologies lead to more cashless styles, isn't it? Would you agree? And for the longer term towards digital currency, we are talking about new forms of um, uh, currencies or banknotes. I'm sure most of you are aware of the recent move from the UK government. Um, Bank of England moved from using paper banknotes, which was manufactured from cotton, unlike other countries, which was manufactured from um, wood bulbs, to polymers, a thin, flexible plastic materials which are cleaner, faster, and stronger than papers. But my question to them is, for how long you are going to use these uh, banknotes, whether it's polymers or paper. Australia, for example, they have introduced this in 1988. New Zealand, Mexico, Singapore, and other countries. My personal expectation would be next, within the next five to 10 years, we are going through more digital currencies, numbers on bank accounts without physical banknotes. I'll keep it at this level. Thanks you.
Thanks, Emit. Uh, move to the next point. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Singh. Actually, this uh, makes me think even more, actually. It is, uh, your presentation is very informative. Uh, it talks about the challenges, uh, new developments. But there are different parties, uh, like the governments have certain strategies for fintech. They shouldn't be lacking behind. There should be strategies for banks. There should be strategies for individuals. Uh, sometimes for individuals, they even seem to be uh, uh, alone, uh, not confronting with this. Uh, uh, I mean, they should first know and be aware of these changes. But at the same time, they have to adapt. Uh, they have to update their business models and so on. What should be the key priorities in all this uh, processing? Uh, especially for bankers, uh, for different groups of uh, people representative among our audience, probably. I'm sure they have different challenges. Uh, we are not just the customers, but we are at the same time bankers, government regulators, and this pose all different challenges. So from your perspective, what should be the key priorities for this different group of, group of uh, individuals? Um, very interesting. Thanks, Ahmed. Um, I think I would agree also with um, the recent uh, uh, pool questions uh, with our um, audience that we would go contactless. We would use cashless much more. And that's why, in my point of view, reacting to COVID-19 effect is really important. That's the first key priority, not only for fintech companies, big techs, financial institutions, but for individuals. As we explained in the previous parts, there are much more opportunities in my point of view compared to the challenges when it comes to individual and small businesses. So we need to be clearly aware of what are those opportunities and how to take them over. We need to work up on partnership with financial institutions and big techs. In my view, competition will become even tougher. Can you imagine that, that, that gross, massive, huge gross of um, Ant Financial, of Apple, of Amazon, of Google, within 10 years, which is nothing compared to financial, will establish financial institutions. They become real competitors and they move towards more mature institutions. Um, the continued rise of open banking, disclosure, um, sharing customer information, to what extent clients will be willing to share their privacy, but open banking is booming as well. In fact, the world it becomes small village. That's my own view. And this, link it to the structural changes. Let me just tell you one thing. Banks were not set up to handle international customer bases. And due to the regulatory constraints and barriers, which are too many, on average, it costs 7% to send remit remittance payments internationally between retail customers. So banks are designed to work on a city, local, national, when it comes to international, they have to reopen another branch and to fit with um, the other area, the other country, the other continent's regulate, regulatory system. When it comes to fintech, it's, it's contrary. It's completely different. Digital commerce platforms are required to handle international customer bases from day one. And they are designed that way. They are designed to reach on a global level from day zero. And that's an advantage above more well-established uh, mainstream banks. For example, Apple, 1.4 billion active Apple device users across every major continent worldwide. Can you tell me or tell me one example about one single bank from day one can have this reach in this short period of time? Unbelievable, no way. Airbnb, 600,000 merchants across 170 countries with $15 billion in 2019, and much more. And this emphasized the idea around much more attention should be paid to structural changes, increase global customer bases like big, team, uh, big techs are doing. Other areas, for example, like build technology to get more intelligence about your customers' needs. Whoever is going to win customers and predict customer needs in the future will win the market. That's clear, that's a fact for me. Whoever will be able to catch these flying data we talked about through the big data analytics will win the market. 
Developing new technologies to predict your client's needs is a key issue for me. And of course, I would believe that alternative lending markets will thrive post COVID-19, regardless of all what happened during the pandemic, but B2B, for example, will thrive again. And this will lead to another area of discussion. My main takeaway is now for you guys, very simple and brief. For me, FinTech is no longer luxury. It is unnecessary. And this means that the market and the industry will continue to thrive. By the way, these 30 to 40% gross for FinTech is my own predictions. I expect that 40% within the next few years will be the growth of FinTech industry. Next few years will witness massive shift towards even more digital world, cashless society. We started already, isn't it? Given the current situation, um, I don't think anyone holds cash in their wallets nowadays. Only few people can do it, and I would predict only in some less developed or um, developing countries. I believe also an advice for you guys to start to familiarize yourself with exhibitions such as bank as a service, BAAS, application programming interface, artificial intelligence, machine learning, biometric, bitcoins, electronic identity verification, EIDV, electronic know your customers, um, voice recognition. I'm sure most of people who live in Europe or more developed countries, they come across this technology where their banks can recognize their identity by my voice is my password which is a unique technology features. You don't require your username, your password, uh, specific information. Once you went through that electronic introductory section, when you call your bank, voice recognition technology is there. Definance, iris, and much more. The human can be susceptible to the virus, isn't it? But technologies like artificial intelligence and, mal and, and ML machine learning are immune. Of course, there are some viruses. People might disagree, but I'm talking in general that people could catch a virus while artificial intelligence and ML are immune in this um, con concept. The world will witness more ways of payments. Definitely. That's, that's a fact now. And the public cloud will become the dominant infrastructure model, going to multi-clouds even. Moving to even more details, access to the necessary talents and skills is a must. And that takes me back to the main point. Think human and machine as automation is not a replacement. Believe it. We need to think how intelligent automation. People should not be um, scared about the fact that automation will replace them. What happened in Goldman Sachs um, uh, three years ago, think that, that way, think positive. Cybersecurity, 238 attacks more attention to big data analytics and how we are able to visualize data, analyzing data are important. Blockchain, cryptocurrencies will shake things up. And I can give you example, as long as the Bayt Mashura is in Qatar, for example, C-Wallet services. C-Wallet is a Qatari first and only mobile application to facilitate banking via blockchain technology. Blockchain application guys are huge, massive. This C wallet technology is now valued at more than $2 million and has softly secured 200,000 of pre seed round from an angel investors, as well as the original founders of C wallets. Can you imagine how fast this blockchain technology is shaking the market now? Moving towards as well, one question for all fintechs, for all individuals, for all service providers. Can you rapidly innovate when technologies, companies, and market change? Our nature as humans is quite different. It's quite bizarre, actually. The way we change, the way we react, the way we fast react to some stuff um, is completely different. Um, there is much talk about digital payments. And my view as well, my personal view, digital currency is in the horizon, is in the near future. That's it. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank Any you. Questions? Thank you very much, Professor. It is very informative, very analytical also. Uh, you uh, share your vast experience from academia and also from the practice. So right now, uh, there's another question, I guess, uh, just 
uh, came up, which is the first question. After listening Professor Hussein for about 75 minutes, uh, whether your answer to your two, the first question has changed or not. Is fintech necessary or luxury, which is the title of the talk. So in the meantime, you are answering this question. Uh, let me also remind you, you may ask your questions from the questions and answer part or from the chat part. There are a couple of questions. I will start with them. Uh, I guess it will be better to, yes, uh, to finish about 10 minutes. At most at 7.30, we have about 14 minutes. So it is now it is even more necessary. Uh, so there is uh, after this, uh, Professor Hussein, your presentation seemed to be impactful <laughs> at the end. I think so it's, it is, it's a slight, I, slight change. It was 94, but I wonder those 2% of our audience, what do you think about how, how they still believe it is a luxury? Um, definitely it is a necessary, whether you like it or not, but I would, um, I would love to listen to their views if there is a chance, definitely. Yeah, you, you may write it in the chat part or later on you may uh, want to express your ideas. Uh, but let me go on uh, with the questions. Uh, again, we have about 30 minutes. I may not be able to ask all of them. Uh, but let me start uh, because uh, especially for Qatar, for Hamad bin Halifa University, for somebody from College of Islamic Studies working on Islamic finance, uh, what do you think about implications for Islamic finance? That is also an area that Islamic finance people are working a lot. And uh, well, I would like to hear your uh, opinion, with your views, Professor Z. Um, when it comes to technology, um, Ahmed, there is no difference. Um, Islamic fintech, Islamic industry is part of the global fintech industry. But what worries me that more developed Western European countries are leading in terms of Islamic fintech. I was reading a report that UK is leading by having 27 Islamic fintech startups above Malaysia, United Arab Emirates, and other Muslim countries. However, there is something unique about Islamic finance. Islamic finance, they have their principles, they have Sharia principle, their style of moving forward. Some products and services from the global fintech industry would not fit for the Islamic finance purposes. However, some countries um, like Qatar, for example, they start to take movements. And uh, I'm talking about Qatar in particular because you guys are in Qatar uh, mainly. But Qatar Central Bank established um, of, fin uh, of fintech sections, fintech regulatory sandbox, and they have established or launched Qatar Fintech Who. I think there is a rule here for governments and for educational institutions. Governments need to react from a regulatory point of view. They need to provide much more support and sandboxes to support fintech startups. They need to offer their um, local economy and to make it more attractive to other, other external fintech industries, fintech um, startups, fintech where are they located in different countries. They need to attract the attention by providing sandboxes, support, ease a little bit regulatory um, restrictions. And when it comes to education, when it comes to um, institutions like Hamad bin Khalifa or Qatar University or other institutions, like you said exactly, providing that side of education, helping in training highly skilled people. If I go back to um, my previous slide here, I sit here, access to necessary talent and skills is a must. How you will guarantee the next um, generation of highly skilled, talented people without high level of education. And the good news is most of universities worldwide now start to think and developing new programs around FinTech. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And th this point I believe is very important because it is not like you educate a couple of uh, people and then they solve all the problems, even though it is technology and a couple of new ideas might be quite important, like the Google, Facebook, others. Uh, probably they are the individuals who are leading the ideas, but at the same time, overall level of awareness, overall level of literacy is important. Actually, this is one of the question come from uh, one of the audience, uh, Mr. Musayettin asked, what is the basic level of FinTech literacy that each and every person shall have in this new transforming era? Uh, that is one of the questions. It's, it's, part, it's part of our life. 
um, not only due COVID-19 in my point of view, um, even if we are not hit by COVID-19 earlier last year, I think the revolution by this contactless world, more digital world, increased the awareness of individuals. Um, I, I know there is 1.7 billion unbanked people, elder people, but do they live alone? Most of them in this developing countries in Middle East, they live where families, where younger millennials and I generations are around them. Um, if you have a little son around 10 years old or something, he would use the iPad and know about technology more than yourself, I believe so. So it is part of the natural development and cultural changes. And whether we like it or not, we are part of it. Whether you are happy with it or not, we are part of it. So I don't think it would need um, um, more literacy pipe, but I think people need to educate themselves, need to read more about FinTech, about the technology, whether they feel confident enough to use it or not. Don't leave it to the last minute when you don't have a choice. Start reading about, start educating yourself. If you have a chance to join one of the programs, join it. If you don't, events like the one we have now would be really useful. But I think it's, it's a revolutionary move, whether we like it or not. That's my um, own views. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sain. Actually, there's a related question. Uh, any change in the operation of something comes with its culture too. If there is any risk coming from FinTech for Muslims, for Muslim countries, uh, do you think of any risks? Uh, one of our audience is asking. Uh, risks are there, um, Ahmed, whether we like it or not. Um, there is nothing without risk all over the world. Um, there is no one thing without um, implying some risks around. But I would say that due to the nature of the Islamic industry, there are some prohibited stuff. There are some prohibited technologies we can't use. And um, that would limit it a little bit, but I think that would increase and raise the attention. Muslim populations around the world are the largest. And I believe a large proportion of this 1.7 billion unbanked people are around Muslim populations as well. But if you want to specific risks, for example, I can mention some of those risks, which will hit whether we like it or not, which will be there. Um, my view, one of the main risks are, most of FinTech institutions now focus upon the Fin, sorry, uh, the tech part, not the Fin part. And that's a rule for our educational institutions now to try to educate them more. Cybercrime is another area. How you will be in a position to develop that encrypted codes like blockchain to protect your client's privacy. Data security and data protection. As I said before, to what extent you are in a position, you are willing now to share your privacy. Because going for open X, the open banking, the transparency process, you have to share your privacy as well. Um, Anti-money laundering <laughs> is another big, massive area around FinTech. But I would say what I've said before, when it comes to technology, in my point of view, there is no much difference between Islamic and mainstream FinTech. I hope that helps answering uh, the question. Uh, yeah, definitely. And there was actually one other question on fintech applications and money laundering. You somewhat explained that question as well. Uh, there is one question from one of our audience. You talk about C wallets in Qatar. Uh, I guess this is in Qatar uh, Fintech Hub, one of the companies there. Uh, one of our audience is asking how to get more information about it. Uh, do you know more about it or I guess it is absolutely absolutely I think if you access um, if you write in Google for example um, Qatar Hope or Fintech Hope you will find a lot of information about this there is a number of articles has been published online as well about C wallet in Qatar I think if you google it Google is a massive um, interesting effective tool now but uh, I, I would appreciate if they contact Python Mashura because um, in my view they are leading the whole Fintech revolution in Qatar um, if you have any questions around any information, piece of information around Qatar, my advice would be at the beginning is to contact Python Mashura. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sain. Uh, there is also one uh, more macro question. Uh, the question is like this. Ant Group is the largest fintech in the world. Do the panel think that the success of Ant Group 
has gone something to do with the political system and it is economic ecosystem in China. I mean, there's this a big question, you know. I mean, uh, I know, I know, I know. Um, that's that's a very interesting question, actually, and I'm I'm really glad that someone has raised um, this question. Um, you can't be hundred percent sure about what's going on politically because we don't have enough information. We all evaluate any um, information, any any piece of situation based on the information we've got. I would give you an example: evaluating um, the reality of COVID-19, whether the virus is a killing virus, whether there is conspiracy theories. We all evaluate the COVID-19 situation based on the available information for us. So studying China, one of the key issues in Chinese market is availability of data is very limited. And whatever data available, you cannot 100% guarantee that this is a true reflection of what's going on in China. But my personal belief is China is one step ahead in terms of technology. And it's not only ant um, financial, it's Tencent as well. They grow massively in four years only to billions, billions of dollars and users. So I would say simply, the more the information you would have about something, the more reliable evaluation and answer you can build. But my view, availability of data about the Chinese markets is very limited. And that's why I can't just only say it's a political issue. But there is massive, huge industry in China. Exactly. And this also brings us to uh, the question, the second question actually posed in the question and answer part. Uh, there are countries like China, very big uh, countries, they're investing a lot for AI. And they don't even rely on other countries because even the size of the country, the population is enough to do this sort of AI optimization. But there are countries like smaller countries like Qatar, uh, and there are also developing countries, uh, less developed countries. When we discuss this fintech issues, we generally discuss it from the uh, perspective of US, uh, China, relatively bigger countries. But I guess we need to have some strategies for smaller countries, for developing countries, for less developed uh, countries. Uh, and uh, it is not very easy actually to come because uh, something to come up uh, for China is relatively easier, I believe, because they have the large population, they have economies of scale. Uh, probably it is uh, the, this uh, FinTech AI related issues are quite uh, natural for them. Uh, but for us, probably we have to even uh, be uh, more eager to learn and eager to practice, invest, to learn from the other experiences. And actually, this also another comment I would like to give because we are almost coming to the end of the questions. I believe that for uh, fintech is actually even more valuable for Islamic finance because in Islamic finance there are certain transaction costs due to the nature of uh, Islamic finance and this digitalization, the actual fintech is a part of the digitalization, is actually lowering the transaction costs. And same thing for another question uh, for developing countries, for less developed countries. Those people are actually might be even better off through fintech. We, we know the applications of fintech in uh, Africa, in uh, relatively in Indonesia, for example, there are very good applications. And this could be even an opportunity for developing countries uh, to uh, fasten their development processes to benefit from fintech on sustainable development goals related uh, objectives. Uh, so these are all, I believe uh, our students, we have to all spend more time uh, studying. And I'm very glad to have, uh, to moderate this session. I greatly learned and in the comments part, the professor saying probably you didn't have the time, but we get very good feedbacks, uh, very good, uh, uh, our audience, uh, declared their uh, very positive opinions. Uh, so I, I'm very delighted, actually. I learned greatly. I would like to thank you first uh, for preparing such a nice presentation and sharing your rich experience with us. Uh, I'm truly grateful. And I would like to thank, actually, Beitul Meshura for organizing this. This is a good opportunity. I didn't know Professor Hussein before. Uh, they also enabled me uh, to uh, know about him more and to learn uh, from him and uh, I will be following your articles Professor Sin and thank you very much again to Beitul Meshura and uh, hope to hope I hope we will have more of these panels more of these workshops let me again remind you 
We have another working group at HPQ on uh, fintech issues. As you see, it's a very rich topic. You can approach it from many different angles, from the blockchain issues, from crowdfunding, from uh, banking related issues. It's it's very rich topic and it is great to learn from each other. Uh, I don't think that there is any single person knows it all. So it is not again like a regular banking finance sort of uh, topics. I mean, it's newly developing and we have a lot to learn from each other. So I also would like to encourage you uh, to join this uh, working group and to uh, listen our panel. For example, next week we have one professor from UK again, uh, Mehmet Sabir Kiras. He will be talking about the blockchain applications. Later on, we will have one professor from Qatar University. We have we will have one friend from Belgium, one of the practitioners of blockchain. So uh, please join our events as well, uh, and let's learn all together. I'm I'm sure uh, we have a lot to learn from each other, as we learned today from Professor Sein Abdu. Thank you very much again. Uh, it is great to moderate the session. And again, I would like to thank all the participants, Beitul Meshura and Professor Hussein Abdu again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. My Thank pleasure. You. Thank you.